Welcome to Squashing the Market with Bill Ullman, a podcast series that explores the worlds of financial technology and investing. And I am truly delighted uh, to welcome today to the studio Peter Renton. Peter is the founder of Lend Academy, the leading news and educational resource for the online lending industry. He's the author and creator of the Lend Academy podcast as well. He's the co-founder of the Lend It Conference, the world's first and largest conference series dedicated to fintech and online lending. And he's the co-founder of NSR Invest, an investment and analytics platform that provides access to online loans for financial advisors, institutional investors, and even individuals. Peter's been interviewed by just about everyone, including the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, New York Times, CNBC, CNN. If that wasn't enough, he's previously started and sold two companies in the label printing industry, including Lightning Labels, which was the first all-digital label printer in the United States. So, hearty and warm welcome, Peter. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here. Let's uh, get into it. Let's start by talking about um, you've had an incredible professional journey. Can you just walk us through some of the highlights and twists and turns from being educated in Sydney, Australia, and today living in Denver, this incredibly successful entrepreneurial life and focused on financial technology. Sure. So um, my journey really began uh, in, in Sydney. I went to the University of Technology and I was doing, I did a computer science undergrad, which actually wasn't that popular back then. This is in the 1980s. <laughs> and um, I thought I was going to be, be a, a, you know, just to spend my life as a programmer in the, in the software industry. But uh, my dad started a business before I was born and then he was getting out for health reasons. So I decided to join the family business with the idea that I would expand it internationally. And my dad had always wanted to come to the U.S. I love the U.S. I, I've, I'd been here a couple of times. I felt at home here and thought I would, it would be a great adventure. I was a young guy, just a couple of years out of college. I, I came over here with the idea I'd be here three to five years. This was 1991. And um, long uh, overseas assignment, it turned <laughs> yes. out to be. And, you know, I kept on sort of re upping, and then I became, I got a green card and became a, a citizen. I have American wife, American kids now, so I'm, I'm pretty much entrenched here. But I stayed in a I, I built up this label printing business, and then when I felt like it, it, it had gone as far as it possibly could with me, I sold it. I started another pr business, as you mentioned, uh, Lightning Labels, and that was the, the first all digital label printer, and built that up very quickly. Actually, we sort of hit that at the start of a of an upswing in. Uh, it was really we, we used online advertising. We were the first label printer to advertise on Google. What um, what year would that have that been? Was two, that, that was that uh, was like two thousand two, two thousand three. We were getting going, and so we, we just hit the time in a in a really you know we just got lucky in many ways on the timing of that and built that up uh, very rapidly. We were the fastest growing label printer in the country, and then we got had a lot of attention towards us. Got it bought by a public company. This was in July of two thousand and eight, three months before the financial crisis, or two months. Timing is everything. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, anyway, I decided after that that I was done with label printing. It was really my dad's passion, my dad's business. Um, you know, decided I would get into something completely different. I've always been a self-directed investor since the 1970s when I got my first um, savings account that was paying 16%, which you could get back then. So real money was in – I didn't understand inflation. I understood interest, though. <laughs> and I, it was fantastic getting getting a, a nice little um, – every month getting a big uh, a big chunk of, of, of change in your, in, your, in your savings account. So anyway, I was – I've always been – always taken an interest. I, I was a nerd – an investing nerd all the way through high school and college. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have to do anything and really was just looking at investing ideas. And um, I, dis I, I discovered a lending club and decided to start investing there and really um, just loved it. I felt, my God, this is amazing. I'm getting 10, 12% of my money. No one's talking about this. I feel like the risk the risk reward equation was out of whack and I was being overly rewarded. So, you know, put a, put a substantial amount in there and then started writing about it because I could see that nobody was really focused on this space back then. So. And this was when Lending Club was in its early earlier phase. Yeah, this is, this is when Lending Club was 100% retail. And yeah, and it really it really was what was called peer-to-peer -peer lending yep. back then because yep. both the borrowers were 
were individuals and the lender was and an it was individual. very much a community i mean I, I started this blog and i had other individual investors you know commenting and emailing me and it was really and back then you could ask investors questions uh, ask borrowers questions and there was a lot of back and forth and you had you had a couple of weeks to make up your mind whether you would make an investment and it was a very different thing but i but what i loved most of all i mean i, I love the whole the peer to peer aspect of it but i also i love the returns i felt like this was really a great way to great place to put your money so one thing led to another and then um all of these the people in this community that i'd built up i had you know several thousand readers and they said you should put on a conference because so we can all get together in person none of us have met we're communicating via via the blog and via email and so and this just, is about 2000 yeah 2013 13, so basically yeah. it was 2012 when i i had like several different people come and say you should start a conference I said, I don't know the first thing about running a conference, but then in uh, like so I said in January first of 2013, I said in 2013 I'm going to start a conference. I don't know how I'm going to do it, and then like January 10th, I get this cold email from my now co-founders um, saying, "Hey, do you want to start a conference?" <laughs> and uh, it was just this serendipitous timing. So I said yes. I flew to New York and we we met each other and we decided to put on the first ever. You know, peer to, it was really focused on online lending. Peer to peer was still, I mean, it was it was a, still a subset even at the first conference. We we really focused on the online lending space um, from you know from taking an investor approach and uh, and you know the first conference sold out really well and the rest is history. Hey, I I think I went to my first one in 2014, 15 maybe okay. in San Francisco. Yeah, 14 in San Francisco. Yeah, 14 and I think there were uh there was a five, thousand yeah, those thousand those a thousand people by thousand yeah. but but very quickly it became much much bigger. Can you talk about that growth and managing that growth and how you did it and what was your secret? Yeah, so we really the um, we went from 350 people in New York and was sold out. We could have had we could have had more. Um, and then we went to a thousand people in San Francisco. And then I remember um, talking to, to Jason Jones, one of the co-founders, after that after that uh, conference, saying we have to get professional here because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And uh, we well, then we hired um, Joy Schwartz, who's now our president. He's a, an industry veteran in conferences right so she knew how to put on a conference and suddenly we became more professional and then we went from a thousand people to 2500 people in uh, 2015 if you look back at, if you if you remember 2015 it was sort of peak um peak irrational exuberance in the space yes and uh you know we had larry summers as a keynote speaker and we it was just the, the energy was was electric it was palpable yeah and uh and we all thought we were going to never stop growing we had two public companies in the space and we just thought we were going to take over the world right and those two public companies were lending club and on deck right yep. which had gotten a lot of fanfare yep in the U.S., let's just talk about that for a quick second. These companies go public with great hopes, great expectations, great financial backers and mm -hmm. investors, best best in the industry in terms of venture capitalists and, and investors. What happened to them as public companies? They they really haven't performed as well as certainly the expectations were in the beginning. Sure, I think you know when 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 they went public, the story was that these are really tech companies that that, that do finance, and so they should be valued like tech companies. The reality was um, that, that has now been borne out by the market. They're not tech companies. They're really you know they're online specialty finance companies, and they, that's that's how they're valued today. And I think the the challenge, I mean, the challenge I think has been that they the industry hasn't. Um, I, what, what hasn't been able to make sustainable profits, um, and it's not until recently. I just I just had Noah Breslow on my podcast, and we were talking about uh, about this very question. And, and you know, On Deck has been profitable now for a couple of years, and they you know they they, they have a valuation like a, a specialty finance company. And um, but he you know he he feels like in hindsight that that you know that was wrong to think that they would be tech that they they were going to be valued like tech companies, but. You know, a lot. I mean, when the I remember the times the fir that first month or two when Lending Club, after Lending Club went public, but particularly when the stock it went public at fifteen, the stock went up to twenty nine. Yeah. You know, now it's down at three. I mean, I know I know it's been a, a reverse split, so it's actually back at fifteen. Fifteen. But yeah. It's really doesn't three. really count. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, the you know, and Lending Club hasn't been able to. Have, I mean, Lending Club's had some challenges obviously along the way, um, but haven't been able to make sustainable profits. And I think if uh, that profit should have been a, a a more a more of a focus earlier on. I think it would have been it would have been a better for everybody. So you think it's a little bit just to summarize a little bit 
of a valuation problem in that it was valued like a tech company to yeah. start, and then it really was more of a specialty finance company in reality. And then secondly, there's been some business model issues with profitability. Yeah, I think that you know there's been a, challenges around customer acquisition costs. You know, it made, made it difficult, and then obviously the industry's had several um, black eyes, self-inflicted wounds that um, that has that has really been uh, been challenging as well. What differentiates your conferences from others out there? There's a lot, you know, there's, it's a pretty big industry, financial services, technology, the mm-hmm. crossover between the two. There's a lot of conference providers out there. You talked about professionalization. What else are you doing? How are you continuing to generate all this excitement? It really is incredible. So we, I mean, we have a couple of different things that we that make us different. First is we are owner-operated. The owners of Lendit are active enthusiasts in the space. This is all, this is our hobby as well as our business. And, you know, we love coming to work every day. We love trying to um, decide how, how to, how to set up the event, what speakers to have, what sessions to have. That's something that we find, you know, endlessly fascinating. And so I think that's one piece that we, that, that really differentiates us. Most of the conference companies are run by conference organizers. They're not run by fintech enthusiasts. You know, you can, you can run a good conference and there's plenty of good conferences in the space, but I think what has really done us you know, a, a great service is the fact that we have been personally very engaged in the industry. We know all the people in it and we, we, we follow the industry all the time. So that's one. The other thing is that we've got this, um, we've, we've figured out that people come to conferences for really, for two things. They come to learn and they come to network. And so we, we've really invested in the networking side of the, of the business. We have, um, if you're if in any of our recent events, you'll see there are thousands and thousands of one-on-one meetings that happen. We have a, a special one-on-one app, a meeting app where you can meet other people. So you've incorporated technology into your own conferences to Most enable... Definitely. Most definitely, and we use Brella, which uh, has been great for us. And people, you know, people love. I mean, particularly if you're an if you're not an extrovert, you f- you may find coming to conferences uh, intimidating because you've got you said you you've, you're supposed to meet all these people, but you're sitting there thinking, I don't want to go up to anybody. Whereas Brella, you do everything on the app, and you know there are people who have. You know, who meet 30, 40 people in the, over the two days of, of Lendit through the Brella app. And that, and we have found that it's, it's not quite linear, but it is almost a linear um, line between, uh, relation, linear relationship between the number of meetings people set and how satisfied they are with, uh, with the event. You have this incredibly unique seat. It's, it's a window on the industry itself because you talk to executives from all over the world who are involved in fintech. Uh, you're holding these conferences. You're an investor yourself. What are some of the key trends and themes that people should be paying attention to that are going on? That's going on with online lending today. Sure. So there's there's really many fascinating trends right now. Let me touch on maybe three. That'd be great. Um, the first one is sort of this kind of the rebundling of of financial services. Like the fintech began where where, where a lot of these uh, these New companies would take they take one piece whether it was lending, whether it was payments or, or you know even just launching a like a debit card or whatever it is they took one piece and they launched with that and now we're seeing many companies offering a full suite of services similar to what a a modern bank does and they're offering it in in a digital way in in a way that really optimizes for user experience so I think that has been. Uh, a great Would Money Lion be an example yeah, exactly. of that? The Money Lion is one. There, you know, there's there's Chime. Um, I think there's there's um, Stash, Acorns. The, the, a lot of these companies have started off in one offering one particular thing to hook the customer, and then they're expanding now into into a variety of different things. So that's that's one trend that that we see. I think another trend is this sort of. Um, anyone, any company can be a fintech today, and that 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 is not something that uh, was possible even five years ago. With you know, there's there's all kinds of companies out there where that you you can basically just plug into their infrastructure and create 
an offering for your customers, a financial offering. You can you can create a debit card very easily. You know, you've you've got all these different ways that you can you know you can do it. You can do this now without becoming a bank and getting a banking license. You need a partner, obviously. But um, you know, like BBVA, I was in their office just a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco. They're another example of of a, they're a bank that is really offering this kind of plug and play. Um, you know, methodology for for fintechs, and I, I see that as something that is bringing is bringing the cost of entry down, and and really making uh, making it much more interesting in you know, and, and making these these companies able to scale more quickly. So that's that's one. The other one is that's probably not talked about as much, and I feel like uh, data, particularly around small business. I think small business is is one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting, space right now. It's just kind of getting going. I know we've we've had on deck and cabbage and, and 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 many others. You know, PayPal are obviously getting into it for getting scale but what that what, what we're getting now is and Karen Mills have talked has talked about this she talked about it at lend it this year about this small business utopia it was in her book where you know small businesses are difficult to underwrite I mean they're 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 not homogenous like consumers every small business is different even every franchise is different because you've got you know, you've got different owners different localities and and hard they're hard to underwrite but with the data that's available today, I think small businesses are, um, are becoming it's becoming easier to easier to underwrite. There's there's a sleeping giant that no one really talks about, but I think uh, uh, you know, and that's Intuit. I think Intuit is a company that that's a company to watch because they have all the data. I mean, they have more. I mean, you, like PayPal has data on on their PayPal transactions, but. Intuit has data on inventory. It has um, accounts for payable, accounts receivable, all the checking account, uh, all the assets of the business. It's got all this data and they should be able to underwrite um, in more accurately than anybody else in the space. So I think they're, they're one to watch. I feel like this sort of small business ecosystem is, is a fascinating trend that we're really just getting going with. Do you think Amazon is also well positioned given that they can see – how many, how much sales a company might be doing in a yep. month, a week? A yeah, year. Amazon. Amazon's also another one, but they don't. I mean, again, what you know, if you talk to you know, Square, to, might be another name. Sure, and if you if if you talk to you know to Rob from Cabbage or Noah from On Deck, they will say, well, sure, that they have great data on on one part of that business. So if a, if an Amazon um, retailer has also you know, they have an Amazon store, but they also might have a retail store. Or they might have some other some other offering outside of Amazon. Amazon does not get insight into the into the whole of the business. So they have great insight into into that part of the business. So that's why I say Intuit is really well positioned because they've got, they've got it all. Let's talk about the online lending industry overall. Is it does it still have the exuberance, the growth <laughs> characteristics that it had in two thousand fifteen? What's what's kind of the big trend in terms of just overall growth, diversification of assets yeah, that so are being I, generated. I don't think it has the growth characteristics of 2015, um, but you know, that was when every, every platform was doubling, every platform was getting funded, VC funding was just was just sloshing around the industry, um, debt capital was available to anybody. Uh, I think now th- there is, um, you know, valuations are, are now more realistic, but the industry is growing and it's growing at a steady pace. Consumer lending is, is is becoming mature. I mean, these companies now, Lending Club, started in two thousand and seven and prosper in two thousand and six. These are these are becoming more mature companies, and so they're not going to double every year. They're they're going to grow in a in a you know in, in either low low double digits, high single digits. That's the sort of growth we're going to see. Small business is growing much faster now than uh, than the consumer. Now the consumer has potential. I mean credit cards are still a trillion dollars of revolving credit card balance which really I think there's a there's a good chunk of that that should remove go away from revolving credit to installment loans and that, that that's probably a, that's a whole other podcast probably but there that but that so I think there's a lot of potential still a lot of runway left for all the consumer lenders to grow. One of the hallmarks of I think the fintech industry overall is it's it's global in nature. Mm -hmm. It it, it's truly everywhere, and and companies are using technology to disrupt traditional financial services players, whether it's in China or in Europe or Latin America. Can you talk about the global nature of the industry? Who's doing it better? Where and 
and who, kind of who's ahead in all of this? <laughs> well, I think um, China, where we, we have we've had an event in China since 2016. We actually are not having an event this year in China. We, um, we decided it was for many reasons, and I wrote about this, the Chinese online lending industry is imploding as we speak. And so that's not, uh, that's, we, we decided that not to have one, but have one this year. Talk about that for one second. Why, okay. why is it imploding? Uh, because the, the, the Chinese government completely screwed this up. They let the industry be, was completely unregulated for, for many years. So these, these companies, you know, the entrepreneurs would come in, it, it, there was no barrier to entry, like $10 to get a telecom license to start to, to have an app. And if you knew how to create your own app, you were, you were in business. You could start a PDP lending platform for $10. So it meant there were some bad actors that came in that, that, that were out, that out to create fraud. People came in who thought this is a great idea, but, you know, lending money is hard. It's a hard business. They had no idea about risk, no idea how to underwrite these things. So they were not fraudulent, um, in, had, didn't have, have a fraudulent intent, but ended up having massive default rates and closing down. And so what's, what's happened is millions, tens of millions of investors lost lost their money in this industry, and the, so the Chinese government is basically shutting the whole industry down, the peer-to-peer -peer lending industry down. They want they they want these companies to become either micro lenders, very very small lenders, or um, have them really go away and, and and provide banks with the technology that can operate these platforms. Let's get back to the rest of the world now. So so that now we're left with the U.S., Europe, no, Latin actually, America. No, actually, we're not. We're not. Let me just go back. China is. I think. I still think China is in. If if you look at broader fintech beyond the lending space, sure, I think China leads the world. Um, you know, China has been able to leapfrog uh, the rest of the world with you know, with, with they, they basically went to mobile banking before anybody else because they didn't have this sort of big consumer you know driven you know more mature banking infrastructure that the West has. So everything is the, the way that mobile has overtaken China. I still think you know you've got Ant Financial. Um, Ant Financial's you know, I think I read somewhere it was worth twice as much as Goldman Sachs is worth, and that was a spin-off of Alibaba. So you know, they are still you know they have the large, the world's largest money market fund. Um, yeah. Ant Financial has, and so they've been able to really become financial be you know, behemoths in China through their mobile apps. And so now, that, and you've got Tencent, which is uh, which is their arch rival. You know, I've, I've visited both these companies in their in their offices in China, and they're extraordinarily sophisticated. Their their underwriting is sophisticated when it comes to lending. Their the whole way they do point of sale. I mean, people now you can go and you can buy a banana for ten cents on the side of the road in, a, in China with a guy with a cart, and you can pay with your phone. That's that's just and no one carries cash. It's and credit cards, uh, you know, the credit cards are accepted, but it's more a tourism thing than actually the Chi no one in China uses credit cards. Everyone uses the their mobile phone to to pay. So I think China has led the world. In fact, the at our last event last year, we had the lady from City. I think she was based in Singapore, Citibank uh, Asian office. She said she loves to come to China because she gets to time travel. She goes to the future and then she sees what's coming down the road that the West will implement in the next, you know, three to five years. And do, do you think this stuff comes to the West? Do you, are Chinese companies beholden to the same data privacy rights that we have in the West that protect consumers? Or no. are, they, I mean, although, are they doing things there that we're never going to be able to do? Yeah, they're doing things there that we'll never be able to do. Although having said that, just in the last month, the Chinese government has really started to crack down on data privacy, and and there there really there are some things happening that is going to bring them more in line with with the West. But I mean, they will never there will never be the same kind of protections there, because um, you know the, the state there rules everything. But um, having said that, I think that we ignore China at our peril. I think you know China is going to find it hard to export what they've done to the West as it is in China because the West has its own challenges. The mobile phone adoption um, for, you know, for, for payments at point of sale is just nothing like it is in China. So, But the, like China is coming to the West, like you can now use Alipay at a whole bunch of US retailers now because, but that's for Chinese tourists. If you're a Chinese tourist, you're used to paying with Alipay in China, come to New York 
and you want to go out to dinner, you can usually you can pay with Alipay at a lot of these bigger chains kind of thing. So you've been um, an investor in these online loans for quite a while now. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, you co-founded a company called NSR Invest. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that company and tell us about some of the trends and things going on as, a, as an investor in these assets? What are you seeing today? Sure. So consumer loans is is. You know, I'm still a big fan. They're, they're recovering. As far as um, what, like, I feel like consumer lending struggled. We got ahead of ourselves. 2015, all that irrational exuberance, all that invested demand caused lax underwriting and returns dropped dramatically. They were already dropping. You know, when I was earning 10 or 12% in 2010, 2011, that was, you know, even through 2012, you could earn that amount. And so that was, um, that has now been corrected. I feel like the, the companies have learned their lesson. Consumer loans are now back in, uh, I think, earning earning what they should be. Investors are rewarded for what they should be earning. You know, I, I'm a big fan of small business. I, you know, I th like Yield Street is, a, is, is one I really like because you can invest in very esoteric things. Like I've, I was invested in litigation finance. Um, now I have like a, a um, invested in asset backed art loans, uh, marine loans for container ships and that sort of thing. These are these are things that the average investor doesn't get a chance to participate in. And Yield Street's a, a company that allows them to do that. And so, and just onto NSR. I mean, I don't. I'm no longer involved in NSR on a day to day basis at all. And NSR really is a way for you know for individual investors and institutional investors to to access these these platforms in a you know third party hands-off way where everything is automated and um, you're able to you know, access high interest lending products. So while we're talking about investing and this podcast is about investing as well as financial technology, can you talk about your overall investment strategy as as an individual? You save for whether it's retirement or second home or whatever it might be. It sounds like you have a lot invested in the online lending industry, but you also invest in equities and other things. How do you go about doing that? What are, What's the thought process and strategy? Right. Yeah. So as I said, I've been a self-directed investor for, for my entire life basically and you know like i have you know i have other lots of lots of traditional stock market investments um do you look at individual stocks do you do etfs yeah i i um so i like i like dividend paying stocks i i've sort of been invested in them for a long time so you know i like to own them because i i own them and hold them you know i, I try and have a diversified i have i have etfs i have like my retirement account is in age retirement target date portfolio at vanguard um, and low cost, yeah, low cost, just dollar cost Set averaging. Get it, get it, get it, I maximize, I maximize my four hundred one k. I maximize my IRAs and uh, making sure. And I, you know, I also when when I sold my my business in two thousand and eight, I put a, a a chunk of money into my kids five two nines, um, which has been great because that's tripled because I got it at the bottom of the market. Um, and you know that that has been uh, yeah, well. So, so is the cost of education. So you've just kept up just right. <laughs> That's true. That is very very true. Um, fortunately, I'm on the other side of that mountain. Tell us about what's upcoming for the Lendit conferences and w what are the next events. Okay, so our, our next event, we're very excited to be back in New York for our USA event next year. We're going to be um, at the Javits Center on small May, venue. Yes, on May thirteenth and fourteenth of of twenty twenty, and uh, this is our. We've been in San Francisco for the last two years. We have had so much excitement and energy around the fact that we're returning to New York, and uh, you know this is where our company is based, and we we feel like there's a there's a a huge community of, 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 of people who are interested in fintech now in New York. Much bigger, actually, I would say, than in 2017, which is the last time we were there. So we're very excited to be back in New York in, in May. And then we have our, our UK event um, in September in London. Fantastic. The last thing we like to do on the Squashing the Markets podcast is what I call the lightning round, mm -hmm. which is just a series of pairs of words. And okay. you, you get to just pick one, and you don't need, even need to say why. Okay. You just have to pick one. So Twitter or LinkedIn? Twitter. Consumer loans or small business loans? Small business. Indexing or active investment management? Indexing. Going public or staying private? Staying private. Social media or public relations? Hmm. I would say social media. Australian Open or US Open? Oh, come on. <laughs> Australian Open. China or the United States? Uh, United States. Data 
or privacy rights? Mm. Data. Last one. Bitcoin or U.S. dollar? (laughs) U.S. dollar. Excellent. (laughs) Peter Renton, thank you so much for joining Squashing the Market with Bill Alden. Thank you. Thank you.